Um, so welcome to today's program with the Backstory Group. Um, as you all know, today's program is the making of of Israeli cuisine with its maker, Roger Sherman. Um, before we get to the main part of the program, I'll just give you a little background on the Backstory Group. We founded Backstory in 2015 with the goal um, of helping to create a, a broader, more multifaceted awareness and understanding of Israel and its culture. And we thought a good way to, uh, to approach that would be to engage pe people in the cultural world, specifically um, people in the film and, and film music arenas. Um, and we've done that by taking um, people in these areas, including students, on trips to Israel where they meet and engage with their Israeli peers. And also we visit film and music schools and, and interact with the students and professors there. Um, and we also give our participants the opportunity to meet people, Israelis who are achieving in so many other fields like science and technology and ecology and fashion, that sort of thing. Um, since we haven't been able to travel because of COVID, we have uh, launched quite a bit of, of uh, virtual programming um, to continue creating these connections. And we've been really fortunate that so many successful film and music people have been willing to um, to participate in, in our programs, including, of course, Roger here today. And uh, if you want to see what we've been up to, you can have a look at our website, www.backstorygroup.org, and look particularly at past events and at Featured. This will be showing up on Featured shortly after, after we end the program today. But today, I'm especially delighted to have this program on um, the making of In Search of Israeli Cuisine, because this film combines three of my favorite things, food, Israel, and really, really fine filmmaking. And we are super lucky to have with us today um, a really, really fine filmmaker, Roger Sherman. And I'll give you a little bio of him and then we'll get to the program. Roger Sherman's films have won two Academy Award nominations, an Emmy, a Peabody, and a James Beard Award. He is a producer, director, cinematographer, author, consultant, and a founder of Florentine Films. In Search of Israeli Cuisine, the film we're going to be discussing today, is a portrait of the Israeli people told through food, conflict and all. The film pro profiles chefs, home cooks, vintners, and cheesemakers drawn from the more than 100 cultures that make up Israel today, Jewish, Arab, Muslim, Christian, Druze. A rich and human story of the people emerges through their food. The film has played in almost 200 festivals and special screenings around the world and has been shown in theaters across the United States and Canada and on Netflix and other platforms as well. If you haven't seen it, it is streaming on many platforms. About Rod, uh, Roger Sherman's film, Richard Rogers, The Sweetest Sounds, Dorothy Rabinowitz, the senior film critic at the Wall Street Journal wrote, it's an extraordinary film biography, perhaps the best ever produced in the American Masters series. That's kind of a big deal. And reviewing Medal of Honor, Linda Stasi wrote in the New York Post, it's an astounding array of stories about an unbelievable collection of unexpected heroes. This special is so awe-inspiring that if I could, I would award it for Medals of Honor. It is that good and honest. Do yourself a favor. Don't miss it. So Roger, <laughs> before your first trip to Israel, you had been in the film business for a long time. You had, you had made a lot of films, you had done a lot of things um, and you were highly acclaimed, but you had never been to Israel. Your second trip to Israel was to make this film. What happened on that first trip that inspired this film? Well, actually I had never really thought about going to Israel. It was not on any kind of bucket list and um, I was dragged there on a food press trip by Joan Nathan, a great cookbook author who's a dear friend. And she called me up and she said, I'm leading a food press trip. Somebody just canceled. You have to come in three weeks. <laughs> I thought, wow, Israel, why would I go to Israel? And um, I wasn't working on a project. I'm always looking for new projects. I didn't have much hope that anything would happen, but hey, it was a free trip. So I went and I was completely knocked out by what I found there. What I think is the hottest food scene in the world um, because it's hot in the South, like the moon, but 120 degrees and it snows in the North and you can get fresh everything all year round, 10 types of tomatoes. 
and I fell in love with the country, the food, the people, and came home and was telling friends, and they either didn't believe me or they just laughed at me. And I thought, aha, you've found a great subject for a film. And so I just started trying to put it together. So that was how it happened. And the second time was to make the film, yeah. Well, that's, that's pretty impressive, um, Roger. And it, and it took a few years, as I understand it, to make the film. I wanna read you something that I found in the 1990 version of Frommer's um, Eat Your Way Around the World. Israel is perhaps the one country in the world that can be proud of the fact that it doesn't have a cuisine of its own. Even at the ripe old age of 40, this is 1990, the state of Israel just hasn't had the time or peace of mind to come up with one distinctive type of cooking that could be said to be Israeli. What you find instead is a melange of, of cooking representing the tastes of immigrants from all over the world. Every country that Jews have come from has contributed something, add to that the cooking of the local Arabs, season it with the wonders of modern agriculture and you have the beginnings of something that no doubt will be Israeli cuisine in 100 years. <laughs> but, but it wasn't 100 years when you found it. So um, I think it would be nice if we, if we uh, queued up the, um, the first clip. Um, and there's going to be an interesting number in this first clip. Um, it's 150. And um, if any of you have uh, anything to say about why you think that number's there, you can, you can put it in the Q&A. And uh, then Roger will explain it to you. So let's watch the clip. <laughs> I've been here before. I know the treatment that you get when you sit down. I said, you know, I just wanted something really, really small to eat. And this is what you get. You get 17 salads plus hummus. This is known as a Yemenite grill restaurant. Notice, Yemenite. Palestinian, Iraq, Moroccan, Moroccan. This is Russian. Carrots are from Europe. Beets are from Europe. These are sort of Eastern because of the turmeric. Turkish, Moroccan, I don't even know. Greek, how many countries are represented in one place? Yeah, so um, that really is the other reason if not the main reason that Israeli cuisine is so special because of all those countries and all those inputs um, from many countries. So does anybody have the 150 idea? I don't see any new chats. So um, I, yeah, I, Linda Wright says 150 countries. Well, that's very close, yes except I don't think there are 150 countries in the diaspora, um, but maybe maybe there are. So Linda, you get the, the prize, but the real reason besides that is of all the different Jewish cultures that came to the, what was becoming the state of Israel. Um, if you think of, Libya, for example. Um, Libya has many different communities that were Jewish. The distance between uh, Benghazi and Tripoli is over 600 miles. So you take the same dish, crime or something else, and it's going to be cooked differently in another community. The same thing with dialects cities versus country. So that's when people, I've heard people say it's over 200 people, uh, two, 200 different uh, traditions that inform Israeli culture. Um, so yeah, that's really what it's all about. It's a very interesting thing. So when you set out to make the film, you knew you had a, a lot of uh, variants on, on the cuisine to 
or a lot of different cuisines to incorporate and with them, their stories. How did you decide which restaurants to focus on? First of all, tell us also how uh, you came to have as your, as your tour guide, your, your cuisine, cuisine tour guide, um, Michael Solomonov. You'll have to say Solomonov. Solomonov. Every I don't know why I can't say Solomonov. that. My grandparents were from Russia. I should be able to say that. <laughs> but anyway, how did you come to, to have him uh, as the sort of narrator? And how did you choose which restaurants, which, which chefs to focus on in the film? Yeah, that's a, and that's a really good question. I don't like uh, hosts. I don't like people taking over. Oh, to our tech, you might want to switch between Wendy and I as the main screen, or, or, or is that the main screen and I'm just not seeing myself probably, right? When I'm talking, does, does the screen switch to? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think Natalie's seeing something different than what you and I are seeing. Okay. Her, I, her she show. knows what she's doing, so I'm going to leave it to that. Um, so I don't like to have a host because I feel like that person gets in the way between what's really important about the subject matter that I'm telling and the audience. I had a different idea when I made In Search of Israeli Cuisine. And that was, I felt I need somebody that really understood all these cultures, that really knew how to talk to the different chefs and home cooks and vintners and cheesemakers. And, and I like knowing very little about the subject of a film when I'm starring a film. I feel that knowing too much means I can't represent the audience. And if I know too much, then the audience may be confused. But if I don't know a lot, which doesn't mean I don't do lots and lots and lots of research, but I have to think, does the audience need to know this? Does the audience want to know this? How is the audience going to respond? And that's how I make my films. But I needed somebody else. And there's a, a fabulous spice master named Lior Lev Sarkaz, Sarkaz, who has a fabulous shop and an online um, marketplace called La Boite, B-O-I-T-E. Uh, he was a chef at Danielle, and he has fabulous things. You should look it up if you don't know him. Um, and he said, if you want the best Israeli cuisine in America, you should go meet Michael Solomonov. That first trip was in 2010. We filmed in 2013. So somewhere 2011, 2012, my wife and I went to Zahab in Philadelphia. And out came a dozen salads, the salad team. And one was better than the next. My wife is Dorothy Kalin. She started Sever Magazine. Uh, the little I know about food I got from her. We are having this incredible, just it's the appetizers. The, the meal hasn't really started yet. Then Mike comes out, oh, the hummus to die for. Mm -hmm. the, the pita bread, like you've never had before because it's being made as you sit down and it's coming, coming, coming. And Mike sits down and this incredible, funny, self-deprecating mensch. And after 10 minutes, he gets up and goes back in the kitchen because he's making the bread every night. And I looked at Dorothy and I said, that's my guy. And he surpassed my wildest expectations. And the way we worked is we would, we had a bus a big giant bus and there were a very small crew, about eight of us, and we were 30 days on the bus and we're still talking to each other afterwards. And we would, we would be going to a location and he and I would have a conversation and I'd refresh his memory about who this person was and what I was thinking we would do. And then I would set him free and he would have a conversation with whomever it was. And Occasionally, I would stop them and I would say, that was great. Can you now weave in and start talking about this? And they would pick up right there. And so together, we would sort of tag team back and forth. 
how we found all the locations is really the same in every film. It's networking is very, very important. You start to do research, you find this person, they lead you to this person. Um, you're talking to different people. Uh, Mike, of course, in this program had ideas. Um, but in fact, as much as he, know, you know, Mike was born in Israel and grew up in Pittsburgh. And so he goes to Israel once or twice a year, even more sometimes before the pandemic. And um, so he knows a lot, of course, about Israeli cuisine. But I got to tell you, 90% of the places that we filmed, Mike had never heard of. So we did some very, very good homework. And, and you're making spreadsheets of all the different possibilities. And we have green and yellow and red, which is fairly clear. Red, nah, yellow, well, maybe. But you know, if we find two chefs that their heritage is Turkish, we don't really want to have that because there's so many possibilities. And so it's a very complicated dance to finally get it down to, you know, the film I think is about 88 minutes and we could have done three hours. And, you know, that's why I've come up with this follow-up called the new face of Israeli cuisine, which maybe we'll talk about a little later. But um, yeah, that's, that's how it happened. The other part of it is flexibility is key to making a good film. Um, and what that means is things happen all the time that you were not prepared for. And um, you have to be ready no matter how tight your schedule is. And we're working 10 hour days and they're long and they're hard and they're wonderful and something pops up um, like a, I can't remember the town it was in, but we were interviewing Erez Kamarovsky, one of the great pioneering chefs. And uh, we, he was walking us through a, um, a marketplace and he said, you know, around the corner is an ice cream store that is uh, owned by a Palestinian and a Jewish person. And you want to go there? Well, of course we want to go there. And they didn't end up in the film, but that didn't matter. We were up for that experience. And only when you, you know, I had another film that I did called The, um, uh, the Rhythm of My Soul about country music. Right. And we were um, filming this group and this guy who, whose group it is, father is a rancher, a farmer, and it was this perfect barn location. And his father shows up like out of central casting and he's wearing a white cowboy hat and he's got this big, beautiful um, mustache. And he says, so would you like to go to a horse auction tonight? Yeah. <laughs> that made it into that film and it's very different so flexibility is is really key I, I think in all your films Roger I, I get the sense of the, the the real well you just said rhythm of but but really the rhythm that I do think that the films are informed by these off-camera experiences that that you have and and that incorporates into your feeling for for the people when you're when you're interviewing and also how or, or have them talking and also how you choose them. And, and um, I, I'm curious, uh, how long did it take you to do the initial shoot? For, forget the post-production, but just the shoot itself. And, and did you have Israeli or American uh, or a combination of, of tech? Yeah, it, was, it was a combination. It was 30 days. My uh, producer and I went a week before Mike and the second camera person came. We had an Israeli sound person. We rented gear in Israel, which turns out to be very important because one of the cameras failed and they could bring us another camera. And um, so it was 30 days. And then um, we went back at the end of editing for what we call a pickup shoot. And if you plan well and have the, the budget, um, you try to leave some days so that you can 
film things that you that you missed or things that came up mm -hmm. that didn't happen. And so we went back for another 10 days at the end. And there's some very important scenes in the film that we got from our from our pickup shoot. So in the end, it was maybe 35, 36 days of shooting. That's a, that's, that's a lot, but it's also, there, there's a lot in the film. So if there's sort of an overstory to this, um, would you say it's kind of um, the one of the pioneers of Israeli cuisine, Chaim Cohen? Can can we look at that clip? He covers a lot of territory in that. In that yeah, let, let's look at it, and and then we can talk a little bit about it afterwards. That's a good idea. Okay, great. One day, I work for a guy that opened a restaurant with French style and something happened there. It was the first time I, okay, I came to him and said, I want to work for you. And he said, okay, I want to give you to taste something. He took a piece of bread, put a lot of butter, a lot of butter, and then he put a piece of a bloody, beautiful roast beef bloody and he said eat and I said wait a minute it's butter and meat because in kosher you cannot mix meat and dairy are you crazy to give me I'm coming from my mother kitchen and he said eat and I don't know God maybe God told me go for it because it was you know the mother for us is uh, something you you never say <laughs> you don't say no to your mother okay and you're afraid from your mother until you die it's not uh, it's not a matter of age you know and uh, I took it and I remember the moment it was I felt that a window opened for me to a new world, a new world, and I said, wow, there is another culinary. I worked for the guy one year, but from this bite, my dream born, I wanted to make a restaurant and to cook a different food of my mother kitchen. I opened my own restaurant in uh, 85, 1985. I was 23. I remember the feeling that people coming to you to the restaurant, eating, they are happy, they are sad, they are love. This vibe makes me crazy. What does it mean to open a restaurant and to eat outside the house? For me, at that time, to eat outside, it, it, not that it wasn't allowed, but it was a shame because the mother was the, the best cook in the world. The only thing we are allowed to eat is to go to eat falafel and hummus as a children. But to go outside to celebrate in a restaurant, you're crazy. We celebrate at the house. So you understand what does it mean to go and to say, I'm going to open a restaurant. And then to say to my mother, listen, I'm going to make a, to make a non, not kosher food. It, it, it wasn't easy. But... My mother was a great, great person. She said, go for it. I started with the French cuisine. I opened books. I make stage outside of Israel in France. During my traveling, I ate a lot in France, in Italy. But I realized that I, I miss my mother's kitchen. I remember every day before I'm coming back to Israel, I call my mother, I said, please, Make me this uh, haricot with the uh, rice that I love, the kube soup, and all, all the things I love because I cannot eat anymore this food. Because food that you don't know and you are not belong to this culture is very intellectual. You have to think. You eat and you think what he put, why he did it, what is the flavors. And from the other side, the food that you go up on it, it's, very, it's comfort. You eat, you don't sing, but you, you can rest. When you eat your mother food, you go back to 
inside the mother, you know, so it's something different. So I said, okay, how I can combine the local food, my mother food, with this glory of uh, French food. I have this dream to make a local kitchen, Israeli kitchen, but I have a, a, a huge problem because I couldn't take as is couscous, lentils, uh, uh, hummus to put in my kitchen because people say, what? Couscous? Listen, I didn't come to you to eat couscous. My mother uh, 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 does it better. Uh, my wife cook it better. And that time people want to eat something they don't know. So I was the pioneer there. And uh, that moment they wanted to kill me. The name of the restaurant is Jaffa Tel Aviv. You know Tel Aviv, we say uh, Tel Aviv Jaffa. This is the name of the city. I call the restaurant Jaffa Tel Aviv because Jaffa is the authentic part of myself. I grew up very close to Jaffa. The smells, the food, the, the, the authentic food, the Arab food, the hummus, the falafel, my mother cook, uh, my neighbor's food. This is Jaffa for me. Tel Aviv, it's the modern city, it's the import culinary. The French, the Italian, the Chinese, everything came to Tel Aviv. I'm Israeli, I am authentic, but still I want to be also in the modern life. So it's a conflict, you know, it's always conflict. My ravioli and tortellini, it's not Italian dough, it's a uh, Jewish krepalach dough. And uh, I have a dish that I call it Jewish and Arab. This is the name of the dish, Jewish and Arab. Why? Because there's ravioli inside the stew of uh, many herbs. And the herbs, the stew of the herbs is very Arab taste. But the ravioli inside is krepalach. And it's, you know, it's Jewish and Arab together. I have a dream that the culinary will make the peace. Food can connect people, can stick people, can make peace between people. Because as I see in, in, in the family, if I see, if I take the family as a model, when we are sad, we are eating. We are happy, we are eating. We are dating, it's in the restaurant. Everything is around food. So why not to make peace? on a table. Yeah, that scene was not in In Search of Israeli Cuisine. It's part of my new face of Israeli cuisine event, which again, I hope we can talk about. You know, assimilation has been one of the challenges of the state of Israel from way before it was the state of Israel. People you know, came from around the world. They often were forced out of their countries. They left everything behind. Um, food was one of the things they could bring with them because they could bring the recipes with them. And they were trying to assimilate in this place. They were trying to become Israelis, but what was Israeli at the time? The dead language was revived. They had to try to speak Hebrew. They had to try to make these cultures. It was a very tough and, from a filmmaker's point of view, very fascinating thing. And, and we, we spoke um, earlier ourselves about why, why it was that there was such limited Israeli cuisine early in the this, in this state's existence and, and how, why it is now that, that it's, it's, uh, it's blossoming. And that there is this sort of cafe society. People do go out to eat now to celebrate. They used to, as he said, celebrate in their mother's kitchen. I, I, I like that personally, but um, yeah, yeah. But but you know, Israeli cuisine really got started in the '90s when that Fodor's book was just coming out, <laughs> um, and it really was because one. Um, 
the tradition of everybody going to the army. And if you could afford going around the world to mostly South America or Southeast Asia, where it was very inexpensive. And some of those people loved food and said, wow, I'm going to come home and cook, cook, open a restaurant. And also is when Israel started to have an economic boom and people started traveling, they went to other places and said, oh, wow, this is really great. Why don't we have that? And Joe Nathan has a classic line. They came back and they said, we don't have to feel guilty about enjoying food. Also, kibbutz didn't have, people didn't have their own kitchen. So it was all very much communal. And they were just, you know, we're just trying to survive here. Don't talk to me about cuisine. And then slowly it, it came up. And the first cuisines was first person that really made a fine restaurant was Aharoni, and he did Chinese, but mostly they started with French and Italian and European because people at the time thought, well, that's what we have to be, which is the same here in New York. It was stuffy French restaurants until the time when people started saying, wait a minute, American food, we can grow great vegetables. So yeah, very fascinating. So it's kind of a, uh, first of all, a, a matter of it wasn't possible because the, there was, the country was poor and there were security issues and so forth. But there's also a, a sort of a cultural confidence, right, that comes with when you... And, and I think it's worldwide. Certainly, yes. I know for a fact it's Israel and the United States, which is a lot. <laughs> yes, yes. And and when you were talking to the to the various chefs... Um, what were, what were some of the things that they said that really stuck with you besides what we just saw, which is, uh, he's, he's such an interesting um, person to interview about why they decided to, to make um, cooking and particularly this style of cooking their, their life. Um, was it out of familial love or just love for food or what, what was something really interesting that was said to you? Yeah, I think it was their love of food, but you know, one great story, um, which is not in the film and it's not in um, my, my talk. Um, I'm sure I, I just lost his name, um, who I mentioned before, the great baker. Um, That's okay, we can get back to his name. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it, just, just shoot me. He became a baker, uh, Eris Kamarovsky became a baker because his partner got into graduate school at UC Berkeley. And they were very young and Ares had nothing to do. And it was the early seventies when Che Pedis was just starting wow. and other places like Acme Bakery was starting and American cuisine was really starting to find itself. And he said, well, I don't know anything about baking. I'm going to take classes and work at Acme, Bake Acme Bakery. Israel had no baking, really, at the time. And Eris Kamarovsky came back to Israel and created the scene that you know now is unbelievable in Israel, where often the croissant is better than in Paris. They're really amazing. And, and he is responsible for starting all of that just because his partner was going to school in the United States and he didn't have anything to do. Interesting. So do you find, um, we're going to talk in a, in a few minutes about the, the food tour that, you, that you've been doing and that you are about to do again. Um, but do you find in general that, because I do find this on the, the trips that where we take people to Israel, people are astonished at how good the food is. And they're particularly astonished at how good the chocolate is. But um, I mean, the coffee, I'm astonished at the chocolate, but they're astonished at the coffee. Um, do, do you find that when you take people to Israel, that this is a big surprise that there's such a phenomenal food culture there? I can't tell you how many people said, I'm never going to Israel. For me, it was just, I really never thought of it. And it wasn't in my culture even though I'm Jew-ish, um, bar mitzvah confirmed. Um, I can't tell you how many people have said, I'm never going to Israel, have watched my film and gone to Israel, including a number of very good friends. You know, don't try to talk to me about going to Israel. And everybody has their reasons. Um, so yeah, it's, it's quite 
amazing, the change. I mean, Israel changed my life. It didn't make me more Jewish, more religious. It didn't, you know, I still have my concerns about Israel, but look, here I am. We're talking about Israel. That's pretty amazing. And, and you're taking people there on a, on a regular basis. As, I, as I am not. I haven't taken people. I'm not a tour guide. But no, not yourself. In early March, I'm doing the 10th official In Search of Israeli Cuisine food tour. Right. And maybe we can put it on the chat. I'll put it in the Q&A. Yeah. Um, a link to it when we watch the next film clip. Um, and we are going to many visit many of the chefs who were in in search of Israeli cuisine. And we're gonna do uh, lots of things that are food centric. We will certainly go to biblical places, but it's gonna be a really great food tour. And we do have a few places open. So if anybody's interested, they should try to um, sign up quick because we're going soon. Yes, yes, you are. Um, and speaking of ancient places, not necessarily biblical, but um, you you have a, a clip about the wine, ancient wine. Um, so uh, let's look yes. at what vintners were up to back in the back in the day. Let's um, roll them. So we are in Ovdat, which was one of the main cities or the capital city of the Nabataeans. The Nabataean culture started 2,300 years ago, around the fourth century BC. And one of their main ways of making money of their factories was a wine industry. This is a wine press. It's just about 1,700 years old. I think it's one of the biggest ones we can see. And all around us, there were vineyards and horses and carriages and donkeys and men used to come up the hill with the fresh picked grapes and put them into these platforms. Here is where you would crush the, the grapes, right? Were they literally like stepping on grapes? Yeah. There people here that were yep. stepping on grapes? And from here, it would either go inside this tunnel or in here to this hole which is where the fermentation used to take place. Wow. So by looking at this size, this is actually similar to a pretty modern winery. We can imagine the amount of wine that came out of this place. With the first Muslim occupation of this area in the 7th and 8th centuries from the Byzantine emperors, obviously Muslims prohibited the usage of alcohol and they have destroyed the alcohol industry, which was mainly wines. So in Israel, the wine industry has ceased to exist from the 7th century up until the late 19th century, 20th century, when the Jews have returned. And they have returned with a lot of money coming from Baron de Rothschild, who was an enthusiastic Zionist. He sent over his counselors from France, and they brought their varieties to be planted in Israel and they tried to create French wine. They made wines that were mediocre. Little by little, these wines became dreadful. But now, little by little, I think they've become quite good, have they not? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's 350 boutique wineries and they're winning worldwide acclaim. Um, the common wisdom till very recently has been that all of the ancient grapes were destroyed and there was no wine being made in, in Israel since the Ottomans took over in the seventh century. Where it turned, but it turns out that is not completely true. I just learned in the last year or so that the Ottomans actually allowed religious Christians and religious Jews to plant grapes and make wine because it was of their religion. 
there was one group supposedly that changed their religion with the times just so they could make wine, or they said they were changing their religion. So um, th that's a new thing. Um, there still is uh, hunting for ancient grapes and some ancient grapes have been found and there are communications. That there's one group in the West Bank that has found ancient grapes and they're partnering with a group in the Golan to make wine. Um, what they found at this point is that it was probably table grapes, so the wine isn't so great, but they're very optimistic that they will find some really good wine. So look, you know, someday soon, you may be able to go and find ancient Palestinian, ancient wine from Palestine. Um, you know, Israel is not a wine-centric country. Wine is very new in the state of Israel. And um, kosher has given it a very bad name. And if you go into your local wine shop, and I'm going to ask you to do this, ask where is the kosher wine kept? All of kosher wines are most of the time put in the same area. This is kosher wine. As opposed to, here's the Cabernet Sauvignons, which are from all over the world not Israel. Here are the Pinot Noirs from all over the world, not Israel. So I, ha I have made a mission, and I hope you will join me to go to your local wine shop, and if you find the kosher section, say, well, why isn't this cab not in the cab section? There are cabs in Israel that are world class. They are, they are earning incredible um, scores, incredible numbers, and that would definitely help. So, okay, pop quiz. What is the difference between a kosher wine? I'm not talking about Manischewitz. I'm talking about a world-class kosher wine and a French Grand Cru. Now, this, this, way of being together and Q&A doesn't really allow us to answer very quickly. So I'm going to answer, even though maybe you know, nobody has yet come up. The answer, the difference between a beautiful Israeli kosher wine and a French Grand Cru is nothing. The only difference in making the wine in Israel is that, and most wines in Israel are kosher. The only difference is that a kosher, a Sabbath keeping Jew is the only person that's allowed to touch the wine. Most uh, winemakers, most vintners are uh, secular and they have to learn, as you would see if you watched the film, um, they have to keep their hands in their pockets. But if they want to check a barrel and see what the, what's happening because they want to do their voodoo, um, they ask one of their workers who's a keeper wearing Sabbath keeping Jew and he takes his pipette and he puts it into a glass, the wine, and that's it. Otherwise, no difference. Pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. That, that is fascinating. So, um, Johanna Chanin has an interesting question. Are you sensing an increase in the exportation of Israeli cuisine and Israeli chefs along the lines of Zahav, like Salamanov, Adelangi, and Tamini in the US and beyond? Absolutely. A couple of years ago, a, a humusia, hummus place opened in Tokyo. Not what you'd expect. No. Um, and it's, it's everywhere, it's everywhere. And Mike Salamanov is, is one of the big reasons for that. Um, his book, Zahav, One Cookbook of the Known Universe, um, not just best, you know, uh, international cookbook. And then Mike, One Best Chef of the Known Universe. So he is out there, if you want to say proselytizing about Israeli cuisine. And um, 
I have been told by a number of restaurateurs and chefs that my film has helped also, that they had thought about doing it and then they saw my film and they said, oh, I really want to do this, but I better go to Israel. And when I first went to Israel, I, there may have been one brewery in Israel or there weren't yet any. Now there are dozens and there were no spirit manufacturers. And now there are spirits being made in Israel. There's even a group called Jews and Booze that <laughs> take people. I'm actually talking to them this afternoon and they're doing a trip just before mine where they take people on food and you know to check out the different distilleries that are around Israel. So absolutely, it's become a much, much bigger thing. Um, the guy who did, who has me known, um, who is in my film, Dorothy, who has me known? Um, A.L. Shani. Shani. Thank you. My wife walked by at the perfect timing. <laughs> Cue the person with the answer. Um, A.L. Shani has opened me known around the world. I think he's open in China, he's open in Paris, he's open a couple in the United States. Those things are, are helping too, when they're, especially when they're good. Yes, for sure. Um, well, as, as we've been talking about, there are many different influences on Israeli cuisine and um, one of those is, is Druze, right? So um, shall we queue up and have a look at, at what goes on at a Druze wedding? Yeah, let's go to a wedding. You're all invited. Druze is a small community. It's about uh, one million people all over the world. About 100,000 here in Israel. The Druze are not Muslims. But the Druze believe that they are exist in this world from the beginning. They are part of the Israeli society. Today we are going to celebrate the wedding of uh, Nurhan and the Imam. with the state of Israel. They, they enjoyed the, to the army. They do it in a big sacrifice. A lot of uh, young people that uh, gave their life to this state. And the Jews had a very proud part of the history of, of, of Israel. And we said, all the time that the state of Israel are, exist, the Jews will exist here. By, by the way, I did put the link to the food tour uh, as a reply to Laura 
Zoles because I couldn't figure out how to do my own. So um, maybe Natalie, you could put that in for people to see. And if you can't come in March, Via Sabra, who helped us with In Search of Israeli Cuisine um, and does all of Mike Salomonov's tours, are a fabulous company. They can do everything from your big group to uh, off, just your family. So back to Druze, you know, they're an isolated community. They are all over that area of Israel and Syria and Lebanon. Um, and they've really kept to themselves. They don't have many restaurants, but they do food workshops. We're going to be doing going to a Druze workshop. Um, I highly recommend doing that if you go to Israel. Um, it's, it's quite simple food. It's very interesting, simple, nothing fancy, not, not, not spicy, uh, worth, worth eating. Great. As, as, you've, as, as is mentioned in the movie, Israel is, is the size of the state of New Jersey, and yet it has all these incredible influences in food and, and all these different communities that, that have in some ways melded together, but in some ways, for example, the Druze cuisine has, has stayed somewhat separate. And um, what do you think is going to be the future um, of, of Israeli cuisine? Is it going to continue to evolve? Um, I, I think it is. I saw somebody in the chat said, so is there Israeli cuisine? Well, you'll have to decide that. I'm not, uh, I don't know. I think what's most interesting to me is that it's continuing to evolve. The, there's more Russian food. There's a really big Russian influence. There's more Georgian food, not Georgia as in the state of, but the country <laughs> of um, and I think it's going to continue evolving, whether one calls that um, Israeli cuisine or not. It's, it's many different things, just like here in the States. You know, we have Southern, we have barbecue, we have all kinds of different foods that come from different places in the States. And, and in terms of, of making a film about it, um, you certainly accomplished a lot with this one. And, and tell us about the new face of Israeli cuisine. So the new face of Israeli cuisine is a, an event that I do um, that is scenes that were not included in the film. So most of the scenes that you saw today were not included in the film. Um, and I was, presenting them in person. And then when the, everything is shut down, I presented them um, virtually. Now, hopefully I'll be going back. I'm actually talking to somebody in Denver in an hour um, and I'm hopefully going out to Denver in June to do it. So if you have a group um, and you want me to come, I'm happy to present it. It was, uh, it, it's been great fun and, and very, very eye-opening. I want to I want to give people a chance to ask a couple of questions, but I, but I don't want to sign off today without hearing a little bit about your next film, which is going to relate to climate change. Um, yes, I, I'm the there's a, a very short scene in In Search of Israeli Cuisine about uh, agro tech. Israel's known as a startup nation, and Israel's known as a nation that has incredible technology and um, it's, it's agrotech is less known. And once again, yes, Israel really changed my life. I'd love to go back. It's small enough. The population of Israel is about equivalent to the population of Atlanta, Georgia. And it has an outsized number of startup companies and successful companies. And it's doing a lot in terms of agrotech and climate change. And I just think it's the right time to show what is going on to help save our world. And um, there are many things happening in Israel and you don't have to do a test in India or some other desert like place because they've got a giant desert with no water. Um, actually, they do have a lot of water under the Negev, but it's all salt water. And, Israel did not invent desalinization, 
but they are leading the world in desalinization technology. And if you remember from In Search of Israeli Cuisine or when you watch it, you will see that Israeli technology has figured out how to blend the salty water and brackish water or fresh water or the desalinated water and made things sweeter. They actually experimented with making a cherry tomato that on what's called the brick scale, which um, measures sweetness, they made it sweeter than a Pepsi Cola. It was totally inedible. And I wanted to taste it. And Mike Solomonov was very upset that he didn't get to taste the Pepsi Cola <laughs> tomato, <laughs> but it was supposedly horrible. <laughs> but, so they, I'm, but I'm sure they adjusted the levels and yes, and yes. And I'm, I'm very excited about this film. It's very, very new. Um, I'm in the research phase and I'm also always in the fundraising phase. You can write, which is uh, florentinefilms.com slash Sherman, or you can Google me, Roger Sherman. I show up just below the signer of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> I don't know why. He's had the top spot for a few hundred years. You know, it's time to move over. But well, that ain't no, look, anyway, I'd love to hear well, from you. I, I think that <laughs> one of the things that comes through for me today is that, that the same kind of we can do this, we got to do this um, sort of spirit that you get that manifests itself in Israeli tech and, and science also manifests itself in food. Now that they decided, Jonathan Strum put a comment that um, for a long time, um, the Ashkenaz didn't think that the that the Sephardic food and the Mizrahi food was as good as their food. And we all know now that it's better <laughs> and it's healthier than our uh, as far, uh, uh, Ashkenaz food. But, but I think it did take a while to get to that sort of position. And also part of that was just what's available in terms of, um, of, of agriculture and, and how they develop that. But, yeah. um, but I, one, one of the favorite things that you said when you were talking about how you approach filmmaking is that you don't want to know everything about your subject when you make it, which is something I'm, I'm really fascinated by because frankly, a lot of documentaries tend to, I find them a little bit dull, but I don't find yours dull. And I'm wondering if that's because you are approaching it without, as if you're not the expert and, and therefore it opens up something for us, the audience. And um, if you can just come in on that and then let's see if anybody has any questions. That, that's an interesting way to look at. It. I think that's partly true, but I also am a firm believer in bringing in very well-respected friends and colleagues, filmmakers and non-filmmakers to come and kick my butt. And you get so inside a project. If anybody has, is a writer or does anything that's artistic, that you, before you know it, you can't step back from it and know, is this working? Is it making sense? Am I confusing people? In filmmaking, you know, that, that clicker is right there. If I lose you for a couple of seconds, you're gonna change the channel. And so I warn my editors that, okay, we're going to have these people come in and we're going to really be in not, not feeling good afterwards. And then the next day we'll meet and the film will get better. And that absolutely happened with In Search of Israeli Cuisine. There were scenes that we didn't know were just completely in the wrong place. And... Um, and it, once they said it, it was complete, it was so obvious, so obvious. You know, Mike Solomonov's brother was assassinated by terrorist gunmen from, from Lebanon. And we saved that in an early cut till the end of the film. And people said, what? That's why Mike became an Israeli cuisine chef. He was making Italian food went to a culinary school where he learned French cuisine. You gotta tell us why he's there. Duh. And, you know, so now it's a short little moment at the beginning of the film 
And at the end of the film, you hear the whole story. So it makes sense. So yeah, there's all of that. <laughs> a lot goes into it. Does anybody have any questions? We're going to have to end. Um, but if anybody has any questions or, or uh, needs any information, you can put them right now in the in the Q and A. Okay. Natalie, I'm not sure people are seeing the chat because we had the chat turned off, but um, but you can see. Um, if so, let's see. Uh, Linda Silverman has another climate change link. Um, nearly every rooftop in Israel has solar hot water heating, not, not an advanced technology, but universal in Israel and a much less carbon intensive way of heating water than fossil fuels. That's absolutely true, Linda. Absolutely, absolutely. And I noticed last time I was down in the, in the desert that there are just acres or dunams of, of uh, solar panels collecting collecting the sun, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. I, you know, you talk about my other films. Um, all of my major films are, there's uh, trailers and sample scenes on my website. You can find them. And most of them are uh, available for a couple of bucks to rent. So if you're interested in the effects of divorce on children or many other kinds of ideas, um, you can watch my films. Um, yeah, I'm also curious, but we don't yeah. have time for it now about your, your one about, um, about um, guitars that's coming up. Um, Jill Wasserman wants to know how you see, uh, how they see the film in search of Israeli cuisine. Jill, if you go on our, um, on our invitation or on our website under coming events, and soon it'll be under past events, you can click on the link that takes you to Mementia Films and it, and it lists the streaming platforms on there. It, it's, on all, it's on all the major platforms. It's on Apple, iTunes, and, and Google, and, and Amazon, and, Amazon and, and all of those things. Yeah, so so it, it's, let it, me know what you think. Yeah. All right, everybody. Well, Roger, thank you so much. And, and our audience, thank you so much. And I hope I didn't miss anybody's uh, one question. Judith Weiss wants to know, what are Israel's pandemic rates now? vis-a-vis -vis taking a food tour in about seven weeks. <laughs> it's, going, it's going down. It went up and it's going down. So let's all cross our fingers because we all, we all want to go. We really do. All right. Well, everybody, thank you so much. And Roger, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thank and you. everybody, uh, check out our site and keep uh, coming back to our future programs. We'd love to have you. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>